Hi, and welcome to The Final Wake Up. I'm your host, Madison Palika, holistic health coach, certified heart math mentor, published author of a number one Amazon new release, and creator of eBooks and courses that help you become the best you possible. I am passionate about bringing light to a world full of darkness and confusion. After becoming deathly ill, as well as severely anxious, and having doctors give me no solutions, I had to find my own way to health. I was mind blown by the things that I was finding, and I became obsessed with helping other people find health and happiness outside of the system too. I'm here to help you become happy and empowered so that you can also live a life full of meaning. You will love the final wake up if you're ready to dodge the traps that this world has set for you. If you want more, you can head to my Instagram page at madison.polika. Join my club at the link in my bio to be the first one to know about sales, product launches, life updates, and to get early access and discounts. And now on to today's episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to The Final Wake Up. This is my first episode in about five months. And I'm coming to you with an extremely special guest. You might know her as Susan Mary Fine Art. Maybe if you joined later, you might know her as Susie Hughes because, of course, her account got deactivated. But I'm here with Susan. Is it Harold? It's Harold. Yes. Okay. I'm here <laughs> with Susan Harold. She is the queen of numerology, gematria. She's very, very good at connecting dots and finding patterns. So I have been wanting to talk to her for years. And finally, today, I have the opportunity to ask her a bunch of questions. So I know you guys have been asking me to ask her about things like the eclipse or doing little breakdowns of the numerology. So we're going to do all that today. But first, Susan, if you just want to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how you actually got into this line of work and why you continue despite all the cancellations and censorship. (laughs) Right. Well, thank you very much for hosting one of of my second podcast, actually. Yeah, my name is Susan Harrell, and I'm a professional artist by trade. I've I've been a um, fine art oil painter for most of my life. I would say around 2016, 2017, I started noticing, like most of us, all of the really strange occult symbolism in all of our entertainment. Um, and I just wanted to know what that was all about, why I was always there. And one thing led to another to me figuring out to some extent my viewpoint of what's going on with the grand conspiracy that we find ourselves in. And I felt like I was led to share what I had pieced together. And I started sharing before the pandemic because I feared that there was a global event planned for us <laughs> to a specific date, to 3-11-2020. It was either 11 uh, November 3rd or 3-11. Those were the dates that me and a few other folks were kind of concerned about. And the WHO declared the pandemic on 3-11-2020. So that was pretty confirming. And I had also feared to some degree that it was going to be a pandemic because Mm -hmm. I was aware of a lot of uh, public art that was suggesting some kind of plague. And it also fits into the biblical narrative. And now I know that the cabal that's behind what's occurring in our lives uses revelation and the Bible in a in the utmost perverted way as kind of like a script. So a plague at their end times, you know, quote unquote end times would uh, make sense. And that's what we have. <laughs> what exactly was it that made you believe there'd be something on 311 or 113? It just kept popping up in a lot of artwork, in our entertainment. You know how they do a lot of, we now know, predictive programming, just like they had done with 9-11. Right. It, it, you'll find it in movies often. Uh, and now when I uh, rewatch movies, I, um, I'm absolutely blown away at how the story of 9-11 and Corona has been interwoven into a subplot, into countless movies that has, you know, obviously nothing to do with 
9-11 um, on the surface level, but if you look at the symbolism, it's there. One of the main reasons was because on 3-11 of 2002, at Ground Zero, they did uh, they had an event called the Tribute in Blue, where they illuminated 88 lights, you know, it had, it had a very blue beam look to it. And it was for 33 days. And on the wheel of the year, 311 is the uh, direct opposite from 911. Mm-hmm. You know, it's exactly six months around. Um, so there's, there's a quite a lot of different reasons. I mean, it's just everywhere. The band 311, mm-hmm. all of their album covers are clearly Kabbalistic in nature. Just, uh, I mean, I could go on and on and on about <laughs> how many times I saw 311 pop up in wow. our entertainment. So it felt to me like it was just kind of, um, and and then also you have three times 11. So you have 33, mm-hmm. which is their the highest degree in free- Freemasonry. Right. Highest honorary degree in Freemasonry. Right. Yeah, you have these eyes that see things that I feel like a lot of us don't. If it weren't for you, I don't know if I, you know, would have started paying so much attention to numbers. And clearly now when you know to look for it, it's like you see the 33 here and 33 there. Um, The thing with Tucker Carlson and Trump yesterday, 33 million views in 20 minutes (laughs) or whatever. Yeah, yeah. And I noticed in the comment section that people were, were saying that there were a lot more views than 33 million views in the 20 minutes. So why did they create a headline for a view count that was lower? <laughs> you know, it seems like, you know, Trump is their guy. They would want to make him look as good as possible. So why would they um, create a headline of a view count that was actually lower? I mean, it's clearly for their gang sign. <laughs> do you think 33. they do it for themselves or do you think that they almost do it as like, oh, the conspiracy theorists are going to love this. Let's put a 33 in here. I think it's a mixture of several different things. I think it's th- that. I think they do it for themselves as like a proudful boast of what they've done. You know, it is a, it is basically a gang and they like to leave their signature mm. on the events that they do. And it is like a signature, you know. But uh, I also believe that the conspiracy ultimately is to reveal the conspiracy. Mm. So... I think that all of these are breadcrumbs that will eventually be put together into a solid puzzle that will paint a picture that there was a conspiracy all along. And this will just be little bits of evidence for that, Mm -hmm. because uh, I do believe that they want to expose everything at the, you know, when this thing all wraps up, I believe that they want to expose masonry the pandemic, the the jab, <laughs> you know, that it was corrupt because I believe it fulfills their prophecies that come from the Zohar and the Talmud, which is what masonry is. You know, masonry is Kabbalah and the text for Kabbalah is the Zohar, which is their playbook. So I think it's, I think it's a little bit of both. Like it's a brag, it's a wink to one another. Um, it's for us the ones who see it for us to start putting this stuff together. Um, You know, in some way we're kind of helping them by doing what we're doing, but I don't care because ultimately the truth is what, what matters. I just can't stand the deception yeah. and it being so, you know, it's so clear to me because I've, I've studied this stuff and <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just, it's frustrating. Mm-hmm. So you don't want pe- the people around you, your, your family and friends to be, so blatantly deceived. I think what's really frustrating too is that like my some of my friends and a lot of my family are like proud conspiracy theorists and they are all in on this stuff except when it comes to Trump. Like what right. is that what is that dynamic? Why do people see the truth but then like refuse to see it when it comes to Trump? Well, I think the Christians have been very heavily propagandized into looking for a savior figure. Um, and I believe Trump is a Antichrist figure. I, I don't believe he is the Antichrist. <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't believe the Antichrist is one single man. I believe it's a, a spirit and he carries Antichrist spirit and he's playing out a role, which is 
like a, a Jesus figure. So the conservatives are, are, are just desperate and looking for someone to get us out of this situation, which I clearly understand Yeah. Um, because I believe Biden is, you know, it's all about, it's a religion based on dualism. So it is the checkerboard floor, the light and the dark, and Biden is playing the adversarial role, which is like Satan. <laughs> I believed that after the pandemic, that things were going to get really, really bad for the United States. Like a figure would come in that would do the worst job possible. Mm-hmm. And that pretty much sums up Biden. Yeah. <laughs> and um, it's it's pretty convoluted because if you say anything about negative about Trump, then conservatives automatically assume that you are a liberal and you support Biden. And it's just that it's the system that they created. You know, Masons founded the United States and they created the system that we're in, which is a Masonic dualistic system Mm -hmm. from the very beginning. And I believe every single um, president we've ever had has been a Freemason. They have worked to keep the population divided since 1776 right? (laughs) over whatever issue at the time. There's a lot of people who are like proud of the Christian origins of our country and the Christian principles they're founded on. My question is, I feel like I start to get a little bit confused of, because I know that they were Freemasons. Why do they push seemingly Christian values? And even people like Tucker Carlson, like you see him wearing the red string, the Kabbalah Mm -hmm. string, but then he, is he just playing a part that he's Christian? Like, why are they pushing these Christian values? Well, I believe the Christians are key for their deception. They have to have the Christians on board for what I believe is uh, possibly coming next. I mean, who knows? It's all theory, but I believe they create a great leader, which is Trump, to it's all about building support for a great leader. Cause you can't you can't make you can't make the population to to do anything unless they feel like they're fighting for something good. Right. Um, so I believe that there is a grand deception coming. I mean, maybe it's aliens or, you know, whatever they, they have up their sleeves that will, um, in some way, I believe that we are going to be tempted to go to war for Trump to fight for something, you know, once Trump is back in power, something that we'll all get on board with because, you know, Trump is going to come in and I wouldn't be surprised if, if um, Trump comes in and things get a whole lot better Mm. for a little, for a little bit. You know, like he straightens the economy out and he, you know, does something to make it appear that he's getting rid of the new world order. <laughs> right. You know, just all to to win support for whatever's coming next, mm-hmm. whether it be the Gog and Magog war, because you you don't go to war for someone unless you and unless the leader has won you over. So. How does how does a leader win us over? Trump is b- being put in the position to win over, like most of the United States. <laughs> right. So it's interesting because there's so many people who are, at least they were for a while. I was back in the day extremely anti-Trump, and a lot of people have switched over. For I mean, I went to pro-Trump for a while. I even wore a Trump mask. Now I don't really buy into that, but there are still the people who are on the anti-Trump side. Do you think that they'll eventually get one over somehow? I don't know. I don't know. They love the division so much and the chaos that's created by having such a, you know, a wrecking ball like Trump. As long as they've got us distracted and not talking to one another, Mm-hmm. Um, that's where they want us. You know, they they want us isolated. They want families to be totally broken up, which they are successful at. So, I mean, it's a really good tool to keep us divided to some extent. But I feel like winning over the conservatives is the main group that you have to win over to, to go to war. Mm-hmm. Like 9-11, you know, the Republicans were real gung-ho about going and getting revenge for what 
the jihadists had done. <laughs> so I don't know. I don't know. All right. All right. To switch gears just a little bit. You said something earlier about how these numbers, they use them as their signatures. Right. And it seems like each number kind of has a different signature. Could you talk a little bit about like what the, I guess, prominent numbers are to look for and if they each have a slightly different meaning, what those meanings are? Okay. Well, I would say the most obvious significant number is 33. Uh, Masonry is Luciferianism. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe it stems from the Sabbatean Frankist cult. I know what that is because I read a David Icke book, but I guess a lot of my listeners have no idea what that means. Could you give just a little brief summary of what the Frankists are? Okay. Um, Sabatea Zeddy, I believe that's how you pronounce his last name. Um, he proclaimed himself to be the Jewish Messiah in 1666. And his name, Sabatea, comes from the planet Saturn. So mm-hmm. their Messiah is conflated with the planet Saturn. And Saturn, you'll see Saturn um, symbolism in, in the occult all the time. You know, Katy Perry will sit on a giant Saturn <laughs> during one of her concerts. Um, it was the, It's the sixth planet away from the sun. You know, in ancient history, it was believed to have been the darkest, furthest planet from the sun. Hmm. And there's a six-sided um, hexagon storm on the pole of Saturn. So a hexagon is a two-dimensional cube. So it's the, it's the interior shape of the seal of Solomon, which is a six pointed star. And this is where 666 comes from um, because 666 is basically encoded into that shape. Mm -hmm. And 666 was also the amount of uh, talents that King Solomon collected per year. Right. And of course, you know, in Christian belief, 666 is like related to the beast. It's a top Kabbalistic number. Aleister Crowley claimed to be the beast 666. It's, um, of course, another of the top numbers I point out. I noticed that they do 33 and 666 quite often. Mm-hmm. Let's see, another one would be 88. And it makes sense because um, a lot of times numbers in an occultist mind aren't necessarily quantity. It's um, more of a symbol or like a sigil. Eight or 88 is makes like an infinity loop. <laughs> so it's um, it symbolizes eternal life, which is what they cult is that's their ultimate goal is to bypass the need for Jesus Christ and live forever through technology. And this technology was given to them through what they believe are like their helpers, the watchers, you know, they write about it in their literature. Really? But but as, oh yes. Um, But as Christians, we know that This is, this is all clearly demonically inspired. And that's the most fascinating thing about all of this to me is once you have a bird's eye view of what's going on here, you can see that no man could have come up with this. (laughs) You know, it's people, people on the outside want to say that conspiracy theorists are ignorant, but this conspiracy is so complex, convoluted and diabolical that it's like most people can't wrap their minds around how intelligent it is. Yeah. And it truly is. And the reason why Kabbalah is so attractive to so many people is because it, uh, through their study of astrology and numerology, you discover that there is indeed uh, an intelligent design like we live in a mathematical equation yeah, and it's not random. And if it really was just an explosion, like the big bang there, there would be a randomness to it, but there's not, there's a very clear pattern and they know it. 
and the stars and planets, whatever you want to call them, they they move over our heads like a clock. It is like a clock. And that's what they do is they set their rituals to the clock. And they believe that with because the world is created as a mathematical equation, that this is why numbers are so important. It, they feel like they can almost, uh, I believe they feel like they can harness the equation and then utilize it for their own purposes. It reminds me of Hunger Games, if you've seen it, the one where the arena functions like a clock and the game makers just control what each hour does. And Yep, that's exactly it. Yep. And um, in a Jim Henson movie called Dark Crystal, there's a scene where I guess I guess it's supposed to be a witch. I mean, they're (laughs) kind of blatant with their figures. She has a clock in her little cave. And the planets are spinning around and she is talking specifically about the great Saturn conjunction. And she says, you know, uh, another little figure says, well, well, what's significant about the great Saturn conjunction? And she says, well, it's the beginning of the world or the end. (laughs) And the great Saturn conjunction happened on the winter solstice of 2020. And that was, was that the day the one they called the Christmas star. Yeah. They called it the Bethlehem star, Bethlehem for, star. for the Christians. Okay. And it was not right. And that is when um, president Biden took his first jab at exactly three, two, two to the second with an all seen eye behind him. And this was nine months and 11 days after they declared the pandemic on three eleven. <laughs> you know, it's always like that. You know, it's always like that. Significant days where they do something like that, they uh, almost always do it where there's a significant celestial occurrence. And uh, they believe that that, you know, charges the event because they truly believe in, you know, the the power of astrology and <laughs> the energies of the planets. Like Mm -hmm. they, they truly do believe that. Um, But to get back to your initial question, yes, I would say 88 is a top number as well. And another reason for that is the sun and the moon create figure eights in the sky. I believe it's called a Anna Analemma. I'm not sure how to pronounce it correctly. I think that's it. Um, So they, they basically form two eights in the sky and the eclipse is also, of course, a very significant s- symbol in the occult because of the religion being based on dualism. So the sun merging with the moon is all of their symbols basically uh, represent this uh, merging good with evil, male with female. Mm. That's why Baphomet is such an ex- significant figure. Um, you know, the Knights Templar worshiped Baphomet. Um, But what they were really doing was just practicing their religion, which is uh, all based on dualism. And there was, many Christians believe there was a total solar eclipse at the moment when Christ was crucified. Right. So, (laughs) of course, they would want to pervert that as well. Yeah. And the, what I find endlessly fascinating is that we are currently in between two historic eclipses. Right. And there are, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's fascinating because the Bible speaks of a seven year tribulation. And a lot of times it's um, kind of the headline will say that there's seven years between the eclipses, but technically there's six years, six months, six weeks, and six days between the eclipses. No, And the first Corona virus vaccine, which was named after a total solar eclipse was given exactly to the day between the two eclipses on uh, December 14th, 2020. It's unbelievable how (laughs) masterful all of this is. Like how do humans even play this out? See human that's, that's like the thing that really gets me is humans can't, come up you know humans can't come up with 
or even become aware of this. You know, I feel like occultism opens you up. You, you, I feel like we are all channelers and you're either going to channel God, the creator of the universe from the Bible, or you're going to channel the devil. You know, there's, there's no in between, (laughs) you know, and if you're an occultist, you're totally on board with channeling all the dark energy because in Kabbalah, you can't have light without the dark. Right. Um, you, you know, e- evil is necessary for there to be good. And it's all <laughs> in Christianity. We recognize that we are all, we all have sinful nature, but you work to minimize it. And we, 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 you know, we recognize that we'll always fall short of that. And that's why we have Christ, but you work to minimize it. Well, it's a completely different I- idea in Kabbalah. True, like Kabbalism. You don't work to minimize it. You, quote unquote, work to balance the good and evil. Mm. Um, but you're taught to lean into your dark side and utilize it for power, um, which is pretty obvious to see how that could be not such a great idea. And this has been a conspiracy that's been going on for centuries and centuries. So, you know, we're just kind of seeing the the tail end to some degree. I mean, I'm not saying that the world's about to end or anything like that, but in the grand scheme of things, it's, it is, what you know, according to their own prophecies and numerology, I do believe that it's nearing the end of their story. So So the end would be a beginning then, right? Because, and maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. The end of their story. Is that really just the beginning of their new world? Yes. I'm, I'm not convinced that they will be successful. Hmm. Ever Uh, or just this time around? Um, no, I do believe that God will put it into it before they achieve what they have set out to do. Hmm. I don't believe that I don't believe they will obtain their ultimate goals. And and basically their ultimate goal is to um, up, upload consciousness and live forever. And I don't believe that. I believe that they are delusional and that's not going to happen. <laughs> well, it's shocking too. Like it doesn't even really make sense to me why you would choose that path when you're given it freely through Christ. Like why not just choose the easy route? Yeah, it seems really silly to me too. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's delusional, yeah. but that's that that's sinful nature. Mm-hmm. You know, it's um, it's tempting. We we are all tempted with it to some degree. You know, some yeah. more than others. Yeah, I was pretty deep into the occult for maybe five years. Luckily, I got saved in 2020, but I totally understand the appeal. And how you think that it's good, even though it's not. Oh, I absolutely do as well. (laughs) Yeah. Advertising for it. Have you seen that? What was that? Mainstream advertising? For the eclipse that's coming up? Uh, Well, I, my husband loves playing Fortnite. He kind of got me into it with him. And I noticed tonight they're dropping a new season. And the theme of the season is an eclipse. Oh, really? Of course. Of course it is. Yeah, well, I mean, it is it is their top sy- symbol. Okay, yeah, tell me more because I didn't even think about the merging of the masculine and the feminine, the good and the bad. So that even is new to me. But I know that there's so much more symbolism that goes along with it, as well as maybe events that are planned to coincide with it. Whether that's in you know, the locations that it goes over, or I've seen you post about the X that crosses over America and little Egypt. There's so much about it. So give us, yes. yeah, the the breakdown of it all. Okay. Well, with this eclipse, like I truly feel like we're living in such unique times. There hasn't been an equivalent eclipse that occurred in 2017 since the Spanish flu of uh, 1918. And that was uh, all around the uh, World War One. So here we have a pandemic that's got a correlation with an eclipse. And then 
you know, coincidentally in 2020, whenever we are right in the middle of two historic eclipses, we have another pandemic. And the coronavirus was named after a total solar eclipse. And it was named in 1968, which is the year they began construction on the Twin Towers. So it's like everything that's happening with the coronavirus ties in to 9-11. I believe it's one 22-year-long Kabbalistic ritual, which symbolizes the 22 paths on the tree of life. And um, could you explain that a little bit more? uh, Okay. So the tree of life consists of 10 Sephirot. And at the very top is a Sephirot named Keter, which means crown. Um, Corona. (laughs) Exactly. Exactly. And then, you know, what a coincidence. 22 years after 9-11, they crowned their new king. And, you know, the royal family is nothing but the head of Freemasonry. Mm. And if you notice, the <laughs> King Charles did this really odd thing where he crossed his arms over his chest, uh, holding two strange objects, which looked very much like depictions of Osiris. Mm. So Os- Osiris is depicted with two arms crossed over his chest. And, you know, they love all of these figures like Osiris and Apollo and Horus. And it's all just Antichrist symbolism, really. It's basically representing Satan, (laughs) ultimately. So the two eclipses will form an X over the United States. It will hit uh, the center of the X, goes over a town called Little Egypt in Illinois. I mean, what are the chances of that whenever the whole thing is based on ancient Egypt to begin with? Uh, So another interesting aspect related, you know, Donald Trump announced that he was going to run for president 666 days after his last full day as as president, which was on the 19th. President Biden became uh, Biden became president on the 20th. So uh, Trump's full day was on. Uh, last full day was on the 19th. Um, and this happened to be 666 days before 9 11, 2024. And hours after he made that announcement, NASA announced that Artemis would launch to the moon. Well, Artemis is the twin of Apollo. Apollo is the sun god, Ar- Artemis is the moon god. Mm. So, what they're doing, we're, we are caught in a grand Masonic ritual of merging the sun with the moon. Yeah. And Donald Trump has a mural uh, of the sun god Apollo in his 66th floor penthouse in Trump Tower, which Trump Tower doesn't even have 66 floors, it has 58 floors. So, why did he say it's on the 66th floor? It's what? for the numerology. He also said that it was 33,000 square feet, and it's not. (laughs) He lied about the size of it, just as one of those little Masonic winks, Mm -hmm. you know. It's so corny. It is so corny. Literally, (laughs) like the cheesiest thing that you could do. It is. It is. So, uh, so, okay, NASA announces that Artemis, the twin of Apollo, is going to launch to the moon. And so that brings us back to Apollo 11 Mm -hmm. and the next president will be sworn into office exactly 666 months to the day after Apollo 11 landed on the moon. How do you find these dates? Like what makes you think I want to like measure the time from this event to this event? Well, uh, to some degree, I believe that God shows me. Oh, absolutely. I believe that I do have some divine inspiration. I have felt that genuinely throughout the last 
um, coincidentally, six years. <laughs> um, <laughs> I have had these strangest experiences that, that I rarely talk about because people wouldn't even believe it mm-hmm. with this stuff. Have you ever uh, heard of the podcast Blurry Creatures? No. Oh, they're an amazing podcast. It's a Christian worldview podcast, and they talk about all the weird blurry things that people don't like to talk about. Yeah. If you could go on there and tell your stories, it's it's like it's one of the top ranking podcasts in America, really? maybe in the world. Yes. Really? It is incredible. <laughs> and I think that you'd be the perfect guest. So God, Ooh, I would, make that happen. I would love to do that. Um, I, the first time it happened for me, I was starting in my mind to kind of intellectualize what a ritual was. You know, you're growing up as a average American citizen. Ritual is not really even a word that's in our vocabulary. Mm -hmm. You know, the occult is secret. Everything they do is secret. This is stuff that I had no clue of. I had no clue of any kind of conspiracy or (laughs) I thought all of that was just total nonsense, you know. But when I started putting the pieces together of what a ritual was, I, you know, they're, they're, uh, it's the astrology and numerology obsession, which works together is so important to them that I figured that they were tying rituals, one ritual tied to the next ritual tied to the next ritual, Mm. which all correlated around celestial events. I don't know. To some degree, I think a lot of it is God leading leading me. But on, on another level, I feel like I just really understand what they're doing. Mm-hmm. I, I really understand what a ritual is now. And I I um people wouldn't believe me, but I honestly do not just sit and hunt for dates. <laughs> I really <laughs> <Right>. don't. <laughs> I really don't. I don't have the time for that. So this is why it's I'm so totally convinced that it's not it's not just coincidental because I will look up things that make sense to me and a perfect example of that. And to, to add another number to your initial question about what numbers are significant, another, so we've done 33, 666, 88. And the last number that I would really say to look for is 93. Mm. Now, 93, uh, Alistair Crowley's religion uh, is called Thelema. And the Lemites refer to one another as 93. It's it's like, uh, you know, to let them know, you know, a fellow Thelemite would address another Thelemite as 93. Okay. And the planet, you know, they're super into, so a word is not just a word to an occultist. They believe they can pack power into a word. So like the name Bill Gates equals 33 numerically. Mm -hmm. So they believe that by naming Bill Gates, a number that has a strong, significant uh, occult meaning to them, Kabbalistic meaning, that that gives that man more magical power over us. Right. And they, they, they truly believe this stuff. And I've, you know, I've read a lot of their work and it sounds absolutely nutty, but they really do believe it. You know, Manly P. Hall has written about it. Albert Pike the uh, the grandmaster of the Scottish Rite, he wrote all about it. Alistair Crowley clearly <laughs> wrote about the power of numbers. Yeah, they believe that they give, they believe they give things power whenever they tie it numerically into their into their rituals. And one one particular event that stands out in my mind was the Kobe Bryant event. Whenever Kobe died, that was the first number. That was the first one that I ever checked a date between dates. Oh, really? And he died, I believe it was 330 days before the Saturn conjunction. Wow. So that was the first one. I was like, oh, well, that's interesting. You know, like I I wasn't convinced that that they had planned it that way. But Mm -hmm. that was the first time I checked the date between a date. And I was like, oh, wow, that's that's interesting. And um, then I started kind of hunting around and I'm like, oh, wow, this really is a thing. <laughs> oh, that's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So 93, um, the the name Saturn equals 93 in Gematria, 93 and 21. There's two, there's really three ciphers that they use the most. 
people will say, well, Jumanji is not really a thing because there's just endless ciphers and all you're doing is picking the cipher that works for your narrative. Yeah. To some degree, a lot of people who are trying to share truth do this. And I feel like they do a disservice to what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think that whenever you put yourself in the position that you and I have put ourselves in, I feel like it's best if we keep it as simple as possible. I do believe that these folks are totally insane with the, the degree that they take their numerology obsession. Mm -hmm. But when you're trying to explain it to others, you will lose people if you, <laughs> if you take it too far. So I typically stick to numbers like 33, 666, 93, and 88. Mm -hmm. Those are like the base numbers. Okay. And I demonstrate how they're using those, how those numbers are worked into our inter entertainment and just uh, keep it as simple as I can because you, you'll lose people. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like learning a whole nother language. You have to start with just the basics because yeah, even the simple stuff I feel like does still lose people. Yes, it does. And I totally understand that because it's, it seems, I mean, it seems insane yeah <laughs> because it is <laughs> you know we we are exposing a neurotic cult right. so we appear to be yeah. <laughs> like we're on a witch hunt yeah yes yeah yeah for sure so it's uh it's not a fun position to be in you know <laughs> mm -hmm. you know i was just uh minding my own business painting paintings. <laughs> uh, I didn't care about any of this kind of stuff, you know, but it, whenever I, I, I just couldn't ignore it, you know, and I saw that th this was very, very serious. And I mean, now that's very obvious to most people, even if they, uh, you know, it's real interesting that the conservatives are all totally claiming to be conspiracy theorists now. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I do believe that eventually conservatives and liberals will, <laughs> will claim to be conspiracy theorists. Yeah, I noticed the <laughs> other day, because usually you can tell like whose page is conservative, whose page is liberal, because they'll have the differing points. But with the Maui fa fires, for the first time, at least one of the first times, I noticed that the Republicans were mad about the $700 and the liberals were mad about the $700. So there's finally one of those strings that are connecting people yes. where they're like, why are we sending this money to Ukraine? Why only $700 to Maui? What's going on? Mr. President, hello. Right. I observed the same thing. There was enough odd stuff around that event that I think everybody is kind of like, wait a minute, this just doesn't seem right. You know, <laughs> I mean, the water supply was cut off. Yeah. You know, um, there's just a lot of really odd things about it. Like and that video with the blue objects that didn't burn. Have you seen <laughs> that? Yes. Uh, yeah, that's weird. And um, blue in Spanish is azul. A Z U L, I believe, which sounds very similar to a Zanzel. Hmm. And you know, that's their a Zanzel, the Zanzel scapegoat sacrifice. That's what all of this is about, is um a demon named Zanzel. Hmm. So that's an odd kind of little connection. You know, I mean it could be a stretch, but it's it's all about human sacrifice. Uh, with the occult. Which brings me to my next question of like, what do you think might happen on the actual day of the solar eclipse? Honestly, um, I, I believe it's a, just a marker. Really? I don't necessarily, I don't think anything catastrophic will happen. I do believe that we will see something in the headlines that I would be able to share as like, Okay, here's their little wink about today, mm -hmm. some sort of Masonic number or... You can see the eclipse for 33 seconds. <laughs> right. Yeah, <laughs> something like that. 
I, I believe that, you know, behind closed doors, who knows what kind of God awful thing would take place on that date. Yeah. But I'm not concerned. You know, I, I told people that I was going to drive to so I could see the eclipse. Yeah. And, and I had a few people who were like, what in the world? Why would you do that? You need to <laughs> hide in your house and pray. <laughs> um, I, I'm not I'm not concerned that something's going to happen like catastrophically on the day of the eclipse. I, I just believe it's it's a significant like placeholder uh, as, in regards to the ritual that we find ourselves in. Yeah. So I'm not concerned about that date in particular. Well, it's relieving. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Maybe a war will break out that date, but I don't, I, it seems a little blatant, you know, for, for that to happen. Yeah. They're not quite cheesy enough to really go through with that one. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, who knows at this point, like, I, I mean, I've seen sh- so many things that have just totally blown my mind of how blatant they are with it that I I can't, it's hard for me to wrap my mind around how everybody doesn't see it by now. No, I know it's, it's very weird, I which, almost... you know, speaks to it being a spiritual battle. I think there's some sort of like, you know, wall that is up a spiritual blocker that keeps people from seeing it. Yeah, definitely. And I believe it directly ties into humility. You know, a lot of the times the people who I know personally who see it um, have humbled themselves at some point <laughs> in their lives, have had some sort of event <laughs> that has humbled them. I know that I have. Um, and uh, it just gives you a little different worldview than parading around that, that, that you have got it all figured out. I think the main thing to... Um, categorize Trump is pride, prideful. Yeah. And he creates a very prideful spirit in the conservatives. And that was um, Lucifer's great sin. Right. Was pride. So I believe it's a spiritual blocker. Mm -hmm. Um, Also, because it seems like with these people, I don't really even know how to label them. Like when I'm talking about it, do I refer to them all as Masons? Is it Luciferians? Is it the Cabal? Is it Satanists? It's really difficult. Like, are there differences between them or is it all kind of the same thing? Um, Well, I refer to them as Luciferians and I don't think there's any, I don't think there's a necessarily a correct term but um you know lucifer and satan are the same entity Mm -hmm. so calling someone a luciferian or a satanist you know one it one is believing they're working black magic and the other one is believing they're working white magic but it's all the same thing it's still magic Mm -hmm. it's still antichrist philosophy ultimately and it's uh it's all about attaining eternal life uh by bypassing christ through technology Mm. um so so yeah i call them luciferians um but it is masonry is the world's grandest pyramid scheme in that it um you know it it really does work like a pyramid scheme i i know a lot of masons that have absolutely no clue of what's going on yeah, they just they you know they feel like it's just um, a brotherhood, and to some degree it is. I imagine there's countless lodges where it is just a brotherhood of guys getting together, and they um, learn about some very interesting, you know, mystical wonders of the world that the mm-hmm. average population doesn't know about. You know, um, really interesting things in regards to sacred geometry. A sh- uh, astrology astronomy you know they learn about topics that the general population has no idea about but are truly fascinating so i can really see how men would get hooked into something like that because mm-hmm. they feel like they're in on something that the average person isn't privy to so that's attractive plus 
there's the whole, you know, people call them knuck, knuckle bumpers for a reason, because uh, you get, there's benefits to being a Mason. Totally. You know, if you're a Mason and you get pulled over, all you have to do is, you know, signal and then you're set free. And that's a real thing that happens. You know, the whole judicial system was set up Masonically. So it's corrupt from top down. And there's very, very immoral business practices that go on within Masonry. Personally, I believe most of our town chambers are run by Masons. Um, And I feel like that's kind of a essential part of how they've done things like Agenda 21, you know, creating, getting us all into cities, you know, chambers, chambers, a lot of the people on um, who work for the city sold us all on the idea of companies like Walmart coming into our towns. Walmart, I believe, was is a Masonic company. So Walmart comes into your town and it shuts down all of the local businesses. Yeah. Um, and we were sold on the um, lie that Walmart would provide a lot of jobs for the communities, which it did initially. But now, like everything else, everything self-checkout. So Walmart doesn't actually provide that many jobs for the community. And all the money that is given to Walmart leaves the community. Mm-hmm. So it's um, very devastating. You know, Target, Walmart. Lowe's Hardware, all of these big companies are absolutely devastating to the local economy, which has created our new world that we're in. You know, we're all relying on Amazon and, you know, we're seeing how that's playing out right now. (laughs) It's not good. (laughs) You know, the, the economy, everybody is really upset with Biden over the economy, but To me, it seems kind of foolish because this is something that's been brewing for a long time. Yeah. The economy has been set up to fail for decades. We're just kind of seeing the the end result of that. (laughs) So, because we were talking a little bit about pyramid schemes and the Masonic setup of things. And both of those things remind me of the Mormon church. So I was born in Utah, born into the Mormon church, always kind of noticed there was something weird about it. I didn't like the patterns that people followed. And before I could put a name to it, I could notice this seems a little bit like brainwashing. Um, So I left at 18 and I've just been doing research and studying all about it ever since and finding these crazy, crazy Masonic things about it. (laughs) <laughs> but I've seen you talk before about some of Joseph Smith's numerology and I think in relation to the eclipse, maybe. Yes. Give me all of the tea on Joseph Smith and the Mormon church and their Freemason <laughs> roots. Well, I'm not going to be able to supply a whole lot of information on that. Um, I'm still learning myself about it, but Joseph Smith was a Freemason and um, I believe that he came up with false doctrine that he added on to Christianity, which I believe that we're not supposed to do. Mm -hmm. Um, But I believe like all Masons, all high ranking Masons, they all knew about the, the times that we're living in now, which is all about the, the eclipse in 2024. I've talked about a lot of significant dates since I've started doing this and I personally believe that's the most significant date. Mm -hmm. Um, And Joseph Smith, I'd have to look it up. I can't remember all of these (laughs) because it's just endless. Yeah. I believe that either his birth date or death date, I believe he turns 65,666 days at the time of the eclipse. And one of the most famous photo if you just google joseph smith one of the most iconic photos is of is of him holding a book kind of up in one hand and his other hand is pointing down (laughs) so it's a it's a little cryptic as above so below right i'm gonna have to look that up i'll put that in the podcast the photo of it 
Yeah. Yeah. I noticed that um, the other day when I was kind of looking at some of his stuff and I was like, oh, wow, because it's always there. You know, the as above, so below. They do it. Um, I remember watching. Do you, do you remember the movie um, Don't Look Up? Yes. Well, one of their main like uh, promotional clips from the scene, uh, Meryl Streep is Mel Strip is standing with uh, her one hand up and one hand pointed down. <laughs> of course. And, um, you know, George Washington has a iconic statue in the same position as above, so below. And I believe that the Kabbalists have, have known about the planned demic for decades, for centuries actually <laughs> because i mean it's it's just it's it's so bizarre because even whenever you get into the origins of vaccines themselves the first vaccine was created by a master mason oh of course yeah and even the ter- terminology all of it like pandemic comes from the god pan right i mean every single word that around the current event stems back directly to their belief system was pan a pedophile or like what was his thing pan was worshipped by pedophiles oh okay <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it's it's um associated with pedophilia gotcha um over jeffrey epstein's apartment in new york the apartment that he was uh West Wex Lex Lexner gave Jeffrey Epstein for a dollar has a, a little relief sculpture of the god Pan over his doorway. It's very clear. Why do but, they worship him? Well, it's the devil. It it it's all just symbolism for the devil, ultimately, the dark side. And it's kind of the same figure as Baphomet. You know, Pan is a goat figure, mm-hmm. um, yeah. and it's like half half man, half beast. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a horned figure. You know, <laughs> to me, it's all the same thing. It's all the same thing. Um, they just for each culture, they give little characters. Their, you know, the Greeks had their own version. The Babylonians. Mm. Um, but I feel I feel like ultimately it's the same the same satanic figure really okay so then a huge question for me comes in right here of Solomon I have always been so confused of why because Solomon is like a godly biblical figure why do the Luciferian circles like worship him why are they so obsessed with him and his well he also practiced black magic Tell me more about that. (laughs) Well, I'd have to do a little bit more research to do it justice. But yeah, I believe he's considered like one of the first grandmasters. Freemasons claim to have built Solomon's temple. Right. Um, And in Solomon's temple, you know, the Bible even goes into the specifics of um, the measurements of all of it. And it's all supposedly like these encoded secrets yes and these secrets reveal things as you learn more and more about them and the you know it housed the covenant of the ark which is what the the holy grail which is what they're all supposedly on the hunt for Mm -hmm. Um, but i believe it's all really just symbolism for something else symbolism ultimately for eternal life Yes. And like a um, equation to achieve that. Yeah, I'm reading in Second Chronicles right now and just God's timing, of course. But it's talking about Solomon building the temple and he hires out this guy. Well, first it talks about King. I don't know if it's Hiram or Hiram of Hiram Ka- Abiff. Yes. Yes. Because yeah. he hires the guy named Hiram Abi or whatever. And I'm like, wait, that's very similar to the Hiram Abiff. And he built the temple right. and uh, I'm reading the NLT study Bible. So all the verses have different commentary. 
so there's this different commentary where it's saying like this verse it like literally it says he built blah 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 and it says we don't know if this is referring to solomon building it or the Huram guy building it okay and then it talks about how there's these like cherubs and palms and these flowers on the wall and it says that these refer to the tree of life which i'm like okay in like an occult sense that makes a lot of sense of why they'd be obsessed with the temple and the pillars because it's talking about the tree of life and then i took a note where yeah it talks about the 10 lampstands and how they have seven lights and it's saying this may have represented the pleiades i don't know just random different symbolism like that where it starts to bring in this other symbolism it talks about it relating to mesopotamia and all this stuff and i'm like wait a second this starts to get kind <laughs> of weird like why is it all symbolic in kind of an odd way like i don't know if it's glory to god or if there is some kind of masonic thing that infiltrated in there it confuses me well uh that's not um that's a little bit out of my wheelhouse it's okay. something I'm, it, it's coincidentally, it's something I'm actually starting to really get into right now Okay. because I've figured out that this is like an area I should learn more about myself. Um, so I have been learning a lot more about Solomon's temple and why it is so significant. Solomon's temple was supposedly burned, destroyed on the same date on the Jewish calendar, the first and second temple. And the Jewish holiday that they observe, great day of mourning is called Tish ba Ba'av. Mm -hmm. And that translates to 9-11. <laughs> okay. So the words themselves mean the ninth of the 11th month is when Solomon's temple was destroyed. Okay, so if you look at the if you look at the events of 9-11, which isn't in interesting that that we call it 9-11, mm -hmm. you know, we call the event that happened. We could have called it anything. We could have called it uh, something related to Islam, which would be more appropriate, you know, or, um, you know, the location like, you know, Pearl Harbor. We call it Pearl Harbor. We don't call it. December 7th. <laughs> you know? right. um, so it's interesting to me that we call it 9-11, that the emergency number yeah. is 9-11. The emergency number was set the year that they started construction on the Twin Towers. No way. And then you look at the the event itself, the, the two 110-story pillars, Boaz I believe, and represent Joaz and and uh, Boaz from Solomon's temple yeah. and building seven that fell at exactly 52033 <laughs> was the Solomon brothers building. So you have the Solomon brothers building and two pillars. So symbolically it, it perfectly represents King Solomon's temple, which was destroyed on 9-11. It's like how many more coincidence, coincidences could there possibly be? Right. And not only that, but the construction company that built the Twin Towers also built 666, 666 Fifth Avenue, mm. which was purchased by Jared Kushner for the numerology because Jared Kushner is a Kabbalist. You know, he and Ivanka don't even hide that. They attend Chabad and they they wear the Kabbalah bracelet. And it's not something they really hide, mm -hmm. but I mean, they, they don't even really have to because, excuse me, the average um, American citizen doesn't know what Kabbalah is. No, they, they don't know what the Chabad Lubavitch group is. All of these things, they just conflate with Judaism and they, their understanding of Judaism is folks who follow the Torah and the Ten Commandments, but reject Christ, and that's it. Right. Um, but that's not what's going on here. Kabbalah, or the Sabbatean Frankists, reject the Torah completely, 
and they have their own texts, which are the Zohar and the Talmud. And if the average American citizen knew what was in the Zohar in particular, they would never support a president that was associated with these groups because what kind they of things are, are in it. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, uh, unbelievable supremacy for one. It, it really is the story of pitting the Jews against the Gentiles, but the, the folks who are in this cult are not like the true Jewish people. Mm-hmm. Would they be different than the Zionists? Is there different, like multiple different factions of Jews, or is it both kind of the same thing? Well, there are a lot of Jewish people that are not Zionist. Right. Zionists just believe that to fulfill prophecy, they are to create a government system, a state, a country, <laughs> Israel, which I disagree with. I believe that that's um, a false, a purposeful false interpretation of scripture. I believe um, that we are all Israel. <laughs> we are all grafted in as God's chosen people. And um, there's not any need for a government, a state of Israel. Um, but this is a, obviously a very highly divisive topic that you almost can't even the conversation you almost can't even have right because you will be labeled with something which i am very much opposed i am a very much opposed to all forms of supremacy however it presents itself and being anti-gentile falls in that category mm -hmm. and folks who follow the zohar and the talmud are supremacists it's a key belief <laughs> in their religion, uh, particularly the Sabbatean Frankist movement. Mm -hmm. So it's a blueprint to uh, create a one world government with a central ruling location. And that is clearly what's happening. <laughs> you know, it's happening right before our eyes. It's, it's really indisputable, but you, I mean, I hate to even bring it up on, on this podcast with you because it's, uh, it is what will get you deplatformed this very conversation. <laughs> right. <laughs> so these, these people who follow the Zohar and the Talmud, would these be considered, in your opinion, the people that the verse talks about when it says the people who call themselves Jews, but are liars and are actually the synagogue of Satan. Right. Yeah. Revelation two, nine, three, nine speaks specifically to this. Uh, and I believe that that is exactly what it's talking about. Interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's, it's very interesting. And this group is also, the group that created crypto Judaism, which, you know, AOC, mm -hmm. people would be shocked to know that she comes from Jewish heritage. She admitted it openly at some sort of public speaking that she was, she <laughs> said literally she was a crypto Jew. <laughs> so what does that mean exactly, crypto Jew? Okay, so the Sabbatean Frankis, the Frankism, was clearly such a horrible practice that they were forced to go underground with their beliefs. So this is what they've done. They, they, um, they worked themselves into the Catholic, the Catholic church. They are the Jesuits. Mm. They worked themselves into the Protestant church. Most, you know, famous, big name spiritual leaders in the Christian movement, like Billy Graham were really 33rd degree Freemasons. Gosh. Billy Graham wrote 33 books and Billy Graham Parkway is exit 33, you right. know, and there's just endless, that's just kind of some superficial stuff, but like, there's a lot of evidence to point to Billy Graham actually being a Mason. He has a star on the Hollywood walk of fame. <laughs> 
Um, what? Yeah. So they infiltrated. They they a crypto Jew is someone who, in their private home, carry out their their real religion, but um, outward appearances. They will join a church. They'll even lead a church or start a church and have a radically different appearance than than their what they really actually truly believe. And this is how they've been so successful in organizing all of this around us because um, they are the masters of deception. Right. You know, I believe that's what Donald Trump is. Yeah. When it comes to churches, how, like, is there a way for people to tell if they're involved in a church or an organization that is a wolf in sheep's clothing? Well, I mean, this is just, uh, you have to just use discernment. And this is very discouraging for me personally, because I, I don't belong to a church currently. And um, the reason is the last two churches that I've been involved in, I kind of <laughs> I had so many red flags and I kind of figured out that they were not genuine in what they were doing. <laughs> I discovered that there was quite a bit of masonry going on. And do you uh, feel like it kind of gravitates toward a certain denomination or is it just widespread? I believe it's widespread. Okay. Yeah, it's it's um it's pretty discouraging because you you want to feel like you could trust going to some <laughs> random church. You don't have to worry about something as suspicious as this. But mm-hmm. uh, in all honesty, I believe Christians should know that it is something that you have to be aware of. Yeah. Especially if they get the tax exempt certification. Yeah, I believe it's very very widespread. I believe, uh, you know, there's a Masonic Lodge in every single city across the country. Yeah. And a Grand Lodge in every single state. You know, it's, it is everywhere. And they have infiltrated themselves into the school systems, into the um, city councils, the churches, And I just want people to know that it's not paranoia. If you have, if you have noticed this as well, this is a very real situation that we have to deal with. I mean, they wouldn't have been so successful. This this is how they are so successful. You know, the octopus is a pretty iconic symbol of the cabal, as we know. And it's because they have their tentacles in everything, (laughs) everything. I am becoming more and more intrigued by the idea of small groups for people who who would like to have church. It's something I'm kind of thinking about getting into myself personally, finding some, some small group either online or locally. Mm -hmm. Um, But you know, even that becomes convoluted and difficult because I feel it's hard for me to connect with someone unless they understand the stuff that we're talking about, (laughs) you know, especially when it comes to spirituality, because Christians have been so propagandized that they now conflate politics. Politics is totally interwoven with their Christian beliefs And uh, so it's just, um, it's a mess. Uh, And then finding people who believe, who have the understanding that we have is rare. I'm sure you have that experience uh, yourself. How how does it go for you? Like, do you have very many personal friends who who understand that are not on the internet? (laughs) Real life Uh, friends? (laughs) Most of my friends are mormon or in the new age i can't think of a single friend that considers themselves to be just christian besides people that i've met online my family for the most part is nothing or mormon and luckily my family is very deep into the conspiracy theories but they'll talk about stuff and it's almost like the republican talking points like the the conspiracy theories that they kind of push 
So there'll be times all the time where I'm like, I follow this lady, Susie Q's, listen to all these connections (laughs) she's pointed out. And I'll start reading it to them. And immediately I can see just like the blank stare. And it's like, huh. What are you saying? Well, uh, anyway, so Trump is getting arrested. (laughs) I'm like, okay, so they're not receptive to this. Yeah. Luckily, my husband, we just got married three months ago now. Oh, congratulations. Thank you. He's (laughs) He's <laughs> the only person when we met, he was still in the Mormon church. He ended up leaving. Uh, we both got, we got baptized together, which was awesome. And I think even maybe he still thinks I'm a little bit I, like reaching. Mm-hmm. I definitely think he thinks that a lot of it is a stretch and a reach, but at the very least he'll listen to me and he slowly starts to understand more and more because I'm yeah. so obsessed with it and always talking about it or right. listening to somebody. So it's definitely a lonely path. I feel like I've made decently good friends online. I tried to start an online small group for Sunday churches. I called it the Baby Steps Fellowship because most people who follow me came out of New Age or a cult or some sort of false religion. So I did that for a little bit, but it just felt weird like having to log on to a Zoom with everybody and like... I don't know. Like, I I think I did a couple of lessons, but I'm like, I don't really know that I'm even qualified to be like teaching other people. (laughs) And so, yeah, it just kind of fell off and I don't really do it anymore. And I don't go to a church. I just read the Bible by myself and hope that it's enough, you know, and listen to people who have a deeper understanding of the world and yeah. Fingers crossed, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're doing just great. So <laughs> thank you. It's seriously an honor because I look up to you so much and I just really admire that eye that you have, just that you see things that people don't see and that you have that ability to communicate a different language to people in a way that they can start to understand. It really is like yeah, it's definitely a divine gift. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, at times it feels like a curse. Yeah, <laughs> but I I, uh, yeah, I see the world very different than basically everyone around me. God has provided a few people in my life who have been just that have meant the world to me and have gotten me through it. I have one friend who I. I am I do not have a strong foundation in understanding the Bible. Through all of this, I have learned how unbelievably important it is. Mm-hmm. And the more that um I didn't really have the confidence to learn about the Bible because previously it all seemed very abstract, yeah, irrelevant. It didn't make sense to any degree but now with this new understanding whenever i do you know a, attempt to under to dig in and learn i'm just absolutely blown away at how profound and i mean it just all makes perfect sense <laughs> you know like things in, in scripture that didn't make any sense before now i'm like whoa i get what that's about now yeah. you know and God has given me a a very small handful of of people who see the world the way that I do. And that has kept me sane. I can't imagine. I feel so bad for the folks who have no one. Yeah. I know a few folks like that. And I I watch them slip further and further into darkness and despair. Because you, you, we have to be able to vent about this. Yeah. You know, this is all very disturbing and unnatural and alarming. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and traumatic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's the days where I'm super interested in all of it and I will binge podcasts. And then there's the next day where I am grieving, like deeply grieving over the entire world and every human. Right. It's just depressing yes yeah and we all feel that it's very real it's it's you can't 
you really have to learn how to compartmentalize. Mm -hmm. You know, I had to, I went through several phases where I grieved. I was uh, in the conservative crowd, Mm -hmm. like really hardcore. (laughs) I was really happy that Trump became president. I would definitely claim to be a conservative and I was very, very pro America. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I bought the whole thing. You know, America is the greatest nation that's ever been created. And, you know, I, I really, really bought the whole story. And to some degree, I still believe that there's truth in that. Like the American people are fantastic. And, you know, alongside with what they created as far as the government, there really truly was a Christian movement. So, uh, yeah, I went through a phase where I grieved the loss of all of that. Yeah. And it, I, I did it all on my own. This was very early on. I wasn't talking about it online. It was just all stuff that was kind of running around in my head. Mm-hmm. And I had to process it. And it was really hard. Was you know, this before or after January 6th? Before. Okay. This this all occurred um, whenever, I mean, I don't know what you want to call it. It all sounds kind of cheesy, but my like awakening or whatever. <laughs> this all happened whenever I figured out what 9-11 was. Like most 9-11, 9-11 is pretty much what did it for me. The ritualistic aspect to that was undeniable. So that was very traumatizing for me to have to process that I had, you know, the idea that you so were so sure of what you believed and to realize, you know, I realized it all on my own. I wasn't just like sitting around watching conspiracy videos or anything like that. You know, Um, I uh, realized it all on my own and I'm just like, Oh my goodness. You know, like I was wrong about so much. Once I realized that, Hey, yeah, I can be wrong. Mm -hmm. Then I was like, well, what else am I wrong about? And I became like hungry to figure out how, how many different ways have I been deceived? Mm -hmm. You know, I am now at the place where I'm like open, totally open to it. You know, I try not to cling too hard, even to what I believe now about what's going on, because it's, it's evolved even within the last year. I've, you know, just constantly learning things and um, having a clearer and clearer picture of what's going on. So I try not to hang on too tight to that. I was raised in a big family and Mm -hmm. I had three older brothers. So, I mean, you might be able to pick up on it some online. I can be a little bit of a jerk. (laughs) in my response, you know, um, I kind of don't take people's BS, you know, and I, that's one thing that I feel like God is like constantly working on me about is always soften your response. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I've learned that it almost never fails. If you're having a debate with somebody and you approach them kind of almost completely detached from the emotion of it Mm -hmm. that it goes over so much better yeah like you really have to learn how to how to lower people's walls because we're all just like (laughs) at each other's necks you know Mm -hmm. you have to figure out how to connect with people just as a person Mm -hmm. and not as an opposing team yeah you know, that, that wall seems like, again, you mentioned earlier that there's that wall of pride. I feel like it, that's the same wall because everyone in the debate thinks that they're right. And yes. if you go at it as trying to prove that you're right, nothing's ever going to happen. But if you can that's right. like breathe yourself through it and get past that emotion and just talk to them like you love this person, like the, what would Jesus do? You know, it's like, yeah. he's not going to argue with someone that he's right. He's going to just listen to them and whatever, you know? So yeah. I struggle with that too, of like, I want to be the one that's right. And I have to yes. realize, like, okay, that's not going to happen. Right. Yeah. I think that's the main thing that we all need to really like let work on our hearts because that's what makes us different. That kind of 
response and attitude is really what sets us apart. One of, you know, a, a Kabbalist or someone who believe part of the cabal, one of their sayings that they have is they are a light unto the nations. Mm-hmm. And I feel like this is a grand perversion of something that's actually true. I believe Christians are the true light unto the nations. In their terms of speaking, nations refers to the Gentiles. Oh. And the Jewish people are the lights. They're the the fallen sparks, the mm. the, the chosen ones. <laughs> so I don't agree with how the way they use it, but I, I wish more of us in the conspiracy realm would think of what we're doing as that way and to present ourselves as that way. And that's something I'm telling myself, you know, because mm-hmm. my behavior online is not always, <laughs> always Christ-like, you know. Right. Yeah. And we're supposed to be the ambassadors. And I feel like at least because when I left the Mormon church, they considered themselves Christian. So when I left, I thought that all Christianity was horrible and evil. And a big part of that was I would look at the ambassadors and realize every single one of them is a big hypocrite. And right. I mean, now I understand that obviously it's impossible for anybody to perfectly be perfect. Like everyone's going to sin. Everyone's right. going to be hypocritical in some way because it's just human nature. But yeah, a big thing for me was I would just look at these people who consider themselves Christian and I'd be like, you're not practicing what you supposedly believe in so why would i ever believe in what you're believing because it seems like you don't even believe it yourself yeah yeah it seems very much just like it's another group another team that people have joined it kind of scares me too and i think probably some of my listeners can relate to this is because most of us have been deceived so many times and like the awakening process. It's not just one awakening. It's like you awaken to one thing. Like I awakened to the Mormon church being wrong. And then I became really liberal. And then I went into new age. And then, you know, I awakened to new age being deceptive. And then I awakened to liberalism being deceptive. And then I awakened to conservatism being deceptive and all this stuff. And I think now that people find themselves with Jesus And I hear people say all the time, Jesus is at the bottom of the rabbit hole. But there are these people in the Luciferian circles who use the Christian symbols for themselves. Um, I guess like an example would be like some people will say that we call Jesus Lord, but Baal was Lord. And so people will start to conflate the two things. And then it's like, oh, well, now I'm nervous about christianity because they're using lord and that apparently is Baal, and so i think a lot of people including myself sometimes get worried that we're even being deceived also with christianity sure so if you have any thoughts or advice about that kind well, of thing right um and i think that that's where this is all leading is i believe that we are being set up for people to become aware of the grand conspiracy and then to have so much distrust that they then ultimately distrust Christianity mm-hmm. because they will assume that Christianity was just created as part of their dualistic religion. And, you know, there's a lot of people online, like if you listen to Adam Green at No More News, that's his position. But I disagree. I mean, for one thing, like the the language stuff, you have to remember that English, I, <laughs> the more I learn about English, the more I'm convinced that English, the language was created as part of the conspiracy. Not that, not that the cabal worked itself into it, but I believe the structure of the English language itself was used, was created for spellcasting. So the word Lord, you know, like the name Jesus, that's, that's not what it is in the original Greek, Mm -hmm. you know, so the translation is different in the original. A lot of people will demonstrate that the numerology of Jesus and Lucifer, (laughs) I believe, you know, several other things kind of equate the same. And 
I have to remind folks that, well, Jesus, the original way it was written wouldn't add up that way. Right. It was only whenever it uh, presented itself in the English language much later after the original, after the original text. But, you know, Satan is, that's his whole shtick is uh, deception. Yeah. So I believe he's masterful at it. It's, uh, you know, the story of Christianity, to me, it's just something that I know on an intellectual level and a spiritual level to be true in my own personal life. I know that there is no way I would have been able to put together what I've put together without supernatural influence. Um, there's just countless times whenever I can give credit to that where, you know, my mind is not even on anything of this topic and I will have something pop into my mind and it, I, I will go and look it up right then and I'm blown away. That's awesome. You know, and it's, uh, you know, I mean, you people will want to excuse it away to your subconscious working and all this kind of stuff, but I don't believe it. You know, I believe that the um, the situation that we're in uh, was intelligently designed. And yeah, to me, the more I learn, the more I'm convinced that Christianity is true. And were you always a Christian or did you start to like take take steps toward it once you started looking into this stuff? Um, I grew up in a Christian home and I would have called myself a Christian simply because I didn't know anything else. Um, and it seemed to be what was good, yeah. <laughs> you know, and I, I wanted to do what was good and right, but I did not become a Christian until I was about 27 years old. I had an experience. Maybe we'll have do that for another oh, podcast. I would love to. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's quite, it's quite the story actually. And it relates very much to my, to my art that I do. I, I would actually like to tell the story sometime. So maybe okay. we can have that conversation again sometime. Absolutely. <laughs> it's uh it's kind of neat. And I've never shared, I've never shared my personal testimony with the my folks online. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm thinking about it, I think that might be a neat thing to do. So yeah, I became a Christian when I was 27 and it was very much interwoven with what I do, uh, painting. But whenever I put together what was going on here with the conspiracy, it was almost like it was almost like God shook me mm -hmm. and was like, you need to take this a little bit more seriously. Yeah. You know, like what's happening around you matters and it matters to I mean more more so than to convince people not to take something poisonous it it's it's truly a spiritual battle and I I feel like people really need to wake up to that fact you know because things are playing out mm -hmm. and uh, I believe that we are in the birth pains <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask that too. Like, in your opinion, where do you feel like we are on the timeline of things? Well, this this is very controversial, and this is all a new concept to me. But I am fascinated by the idea that we are in the little season, and I know that this theory is gaining momentum mm -hmm. uh, in Christian community. I've seen others talk about it. I understand people being totally turned off by the idea. Yeah. But it it's uh something I'm considering. It makes a lot of sense to me. So that's that's kind of where I I land. Uh it would make sense to me as far as what the occult is trying to do as well because they are clearly deceiving the Christian church and they're quite obviously trying to manipulate them to believing that the return of Jesus is upon us at any moment. And I'm not saying that he's not, you know, I don't, I don't know, but I, I find that specific type of manipulation to be interesting in regards to what if we really are in the little season and Christ had already returned. And the next chapter is actually 
the new Jerusalem, like, <laughs> you know, the create the God create fixing what has been broken. Mm-hmm. So I'm open to that. Um, I'm open to me being wrong about that as well. I'm just, um, you know, like we said before, I, I was wrong about so much other stuff that could be. Right. Um, so. And we know that definitely our history gets manipulated and distorted and covered up. So it's right. is a possibility that there could be big things that have happened that are just hidden from us. Yes. Very likely. They definitely have manipulated the calendars and our timeline. <laughs> I mean, that's for sure. I mean, we're on a pagan calendar. Yeah. So. <laughs> so we've been talking for about two hours now. I just have two final questions. Okay. First question. If you are open, you know, you can say as much as you want or as little as you want. But I'm just curious, what do you and God talk about behind closed doors? these days? Um, that's a good question. (laughs) Mostly I am in prayer about discernment and, oh, that's tough. (laughs) There's, I'm like thinking of so many different things. (laughs) Yeah. Guidance of how to handle myself, how to confidence, you know, uh, confidence in what I'm doing and how to handle myself and how to, I'm often praying for, I have had a lot of trauma in my life Mm. and I'm not just referring to, you know, current events and everything that we've learned, but before that. And I think that it probably plays into why I was able to put together some things is because I had been through a traumatic, you know, several traumatic events personally. So I I feel like I am in constant communication on healing for, for trauma. Yeah. Healing for trauma is a, is a main, a main conversation and guidance and how to carry myself in this world with the understanding that I have mm-hmm. because it's not comfortable. No. Um, and, uh, how to deal, how to deal with that discomfort. Cause it's very, very uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can imagine with as many people that follow you and as many shares as your stuff gets, I can only imagine that even on just one superficial layer, you're having trolls endlessly just insult you and who knows what there could be people mm casting spells against you and all this different. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I can deal with, um, the hateful comments. I, that doesn't really bother me. Most of the time I read them and I laugh, honestly, (laughs) um, because people can come up with some wildly aggressive, awful things to say, you know, it's, it's really kind of funny actually. And, you know, like I was saying before, I grew up with three older brothers, like, I am used to that, (laughs) but, uh, in my personal life, because, okay, I have a hard time articulating what I'm trying to say here in my personal life, because of what I do being a painter, it has put me in certain positions that I would imagine, you know, the average person doesn't get presented with. And because I'm hyper aware of how masonry how masonry works and how the system works i have never been a paranoid person in my whole life and this has made me paranoid yeah and that's the biggest thing that i deal with is my natural urge is to trust people to almost to a naive level. I have always been a trusting person. <laughs> I think a lot of us are and now now I'm not. And I've had legitimate reasons in my life for, for that to develop. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had certain opportunities come my way that I've turned down. I I currently have a uh, phenomenal opportunity that's uh, developing. And I just, um, I hate that I question everything that comes my way now. 
I'm yeah. like, what's what's their motivation? <laughs> what am I getting into? Is mm-hmm. this the right thing to do? You know, and then I have another layer of you may experience this on yourself, but people are, are constantly on a witch hunt for controlled opposition. Yeah. You know, and I've been accused of that <laughs> a lot. And people go through my paintings and they're like, oh, there's, you know, I know it. <laughs> you know, so I'm like, well, if I go, if I do this thing, that's, it seems like a cool opportunity. Well, all the people that I'm trying to influence in a good way, will they, will that make them suspicious, suspicious of me? Right. You know, so this all of this stuff that I never dreamed I would have to contemplate. Mm-hmm. I'm constantly having to work out in my mind. So I'm I find myself having conversations with God with discernment with how to handle all of that. Mm-hmm. And you discernment's know, tough. It is. It's very tough because you fight with your own ego, you know. Yeah, that's that's the biggest thing is like conversations on discernment over these types of situations and how, how to handle myself, Mm -hmm. because that's, that's probably the biggest um, challenge I've had throughout my life is how I handle myself with others. So a work in progress. (laughs) Always, always a work in progress. Right. Do you feel like God gives you any wisdom on it? Or like, have you noticed any like repeated messages, I guess, from the spirit that you feel like you've been able to grasp onto? I do. I do. I really feel like God has shown me when there's things that I should turn down. Mm -hmm. I feel like I get pretty clear signs when I ask for them. Yes, I do. I, I do believe I hear from God on these on these issues. And it's like you know, it's not like I hear a voice or anything, but I, I uh, develop a sense of peace about the decision mm-hmm. and I feel at ease about it. And it's that rest that I'm ultimately looking for. Mm. Yeah. yeah. So if you could say maybe there's nothing or maybe there's something big that's been on your heart. If you could say that there's anything you feel like God is wanting to speak to you or just to people in general, do you feel like he is saying anything? Yes. I feel like we all need to be very attentive and proactive with loving each other well. Mm. And the way we are being led right now is to create others and create groups and form teams and division. And I feel like we should do everything we can to do the exact opposite. Mm-hmm. If, uh, you know, you know, people on Facebook are like, well, if you do this or this or whatever, then I'm, blo- I'm blocking you. Christians yeah. are notoriously doing that now. And I'm like, okay, guys, we need, uh, collectively, we, we all need to do the exact opposite of what they're trying to do. Like the moment you block somebody, you end the conversation. Mm -hmm. So reach out as much as you can to the people who have the most polar, polar opposite belief as you, (laughs) you know, like if you're, if you are more in the conservative realm, reach out to the folks who carry more liberal worldview. Yeah. Make friends with a liberal. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> you know, and like be genuine in it because I feel like they're find common ground mm. is what I think we should all do because there is, you know, like uh, the left has enough bizarre sound bites of Donald Trump, you know, that we can relate on. Yeah, the guy is strange and has <laughs> said some awful stuff, you know, and I really feel like the moment you the moment you try to connect with somebody that wall starts to kind of come down a little bit and that's i feel like that's all we're really trying to do is uh connect with one another mm-hmm. and you know the devil comes to the divide and i feel like 
all of us, even if you're not a, a Christian person, I feel like to um, to fight against what's what's being presented is to do the exact opposite of that, is to try to uh, mend all of these relationships. And I notice that even in Christian circles these days is that people will have these small differences in their belief and they will just go to war with each other. And I'm like, okay, what matters here is that you both believe in Jesus, correct? You believe you are saved by grace through faith. Why does it matter if they do Sabbath on a Saturday or Sunday or whatever it is? There's these right. little tiny things that Christians love to argue with each other about. And it just seems so counterproductive. Yes. Yeah. I think we need to learn how to be a lot more accepting of other others because I mean, I believe the craziest stuff as well, just not very long ago, <laughs> you know, just be more open, open-minded to people and understanding of how intense the propaganda is, you know, like young, young children have no chance, like good luck with them <laughs> not being confused about their gender, you yeah. know? And I, and I'm like, uh, okay, I probably would have been too, <laughs> you know, like we're just totally saturated with propaganda. So instead of casting so much judgment on that, have a little bit of under, uh, understanding. And I don't know, I just, I just wish people would turn the temperature down just a little bit. Yeah. It sounds a little hippy dippy, but <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's the most important thing right now. Yeah. You know, everything is just so divisive. And I would really like to do the opposite of that. And it's easy to see other people as the enemy, but in all reality, they're victims of they're victims. Yeah, of brainwash and like yeah. you said, the English language being like spells. That right. stuff is real and people are confused and they're brains are being messed with their bodies are being messed with they're being yes. poisoned all these different things like if people aren't thinking straight it's not their own fault it's not their own fault that's for sure yeah yeah and you know our hormones are all being s screwed up with on so many different levels so i mean just have a carry a little bit more grace <laughs> with yeah. it you know um the guy that's dressed up as a drag queen with demon horns reading to children at a public library, he, he got that way because of their system, because of propaganda, mm -hmm. you know? So, you know, if you want to win that person over, uh, try a different approach because blocking people out is not going to do anything to change their minds. It's only going to have them dig their heels in deeper. <laughs> right. It reminds me again with the Hunger Games references um, in that same movie where the playing field is like a clock. Katniss, the main character, for anyone who doesn't know, is obviously they're put in this arena and they're all supposed to kill each other until one is left standing. And she doesn't know that players are working together for her cause. She has no idea. But so she's becoming really suspicious of all these other people in the arena with her, obviously. And one of the guys says to her, remember who the real enemy is. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that felt it like pierced me. I'm like, that is so true. We all have to remember who the real enemy is. Right. I absolutely agree. <laughs> that's perfect. Okay. Well, I think that's everything. We've been on here for a long time. Do you have any last thoughts, anything that you would like to say? Well, um, I thank you again for giving me the opportunity to get some practice doing podcasting. I feel like I, I ramble quite a bit, um, no. <laughs> but I'm, yeah, I'm kind of all over the place, but it's just, I've got, you know, there's just so many different ra rabbit holes you can get into. Yeah. Um, but I do thank you very much for, um, offering to host this. I hope your listeners enjoy it. Um, oh, they will. <laughs> yeah. And if you ever would like to do it again, maybe, um, maybe I could share my testimony. Just uh, feel free to ask and we can do this again. Yeah. Yeah. And I thank you too. I appreciate you being so vulnerable about just everything you've learned and putting yourself out there and even parts of your own personal story. It's been really awesome to hear, you know, I look up to you. I know that a lot of my followers look up to you too. 
And yeah, it's just been an amazing opportunity to talk to you. I've had <laughs> these questions that I've wanted to ask you for seriously years now. Oh, wow. So <laughs> well, thankful thank you. to you and thankful to God for putting this all together and just yeah. making this opportunity happen. And yeah, I would love to have you on again and talk about anything, talk about your testimony. If you want to plug your social media or any like projects that you have going on, let us know where we can connect with you or learn more. Okay. Well, a lot of you probably know me from Instagram because that's where <laughs> that's where I do my ranting. And it's Suzy Q's, S-U-Z-I-E-C-U-E-S underscore. And I am I am going to set up a Patreon. I'm working on that now. And uh, my real name is Susan Harrell, and that's H-A-R-R-E-L-L. -L. If you go to SusanHarrell.com, you can see my artwork. Uh, I'm, like I said before, I'm a full-time painter. So that's what I do. <laughs> and you have a Facebook too. I follow you there. She posts. Oh, yes. I have a Facebook. Um, I don't post very much on Facebook because I, I shared something about masonry uh, several months ago now, and I instantly got flagged and my page has been restricted up until like a couple days ago. So um, I've noticed Facebook is, uh, I think Facebook is probably the worst in regards to censorship. Could be wrong about that, but it just feels that way to me. I am going to try to share again on Facebook soon. My family will enjoy that. So, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, feel free to send me a friend request on Facebook. If I can figure out a way to word stuff without getting banned, I'm going to try to start to share more on Facebook as well. <laughs> awesome. And everyone who has anything to say about someone starting a Patreon and getting paid for their work, people absolutely have the right to be paid. Susan is creating so much value for so many people. Her first account, what did you have like 18,000 followers? It was somewhere around that area. Yeah. Right. So that got deactivated and she has this new account that's grown to 10,000 followers. So obviously there is a need and a desire for what she's saying. So I don't want anyone coming at her for charging money for a Patreon. <laughs> Your donations are what keep people being able to make this kind of work because obviously we live real lives you have to pay you know maybe rent and groceries and everything so right. don't come at anybody who's doing the good work for charging something for some of it because they're probably still giving you free content on instagram right which i'm sure you will be oh so. yeah for sure yeah so i just want to quash that before anyone gets all up in arms about charging money. If people have something valuable, they should not just give it away for free all of the time. So that's my little spiel. On that. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, it's, it is a lot of work to research our, our reality and not just be fun, uh, spoon fed um, news, you know, to mm -hmm. learn all of this stuff on, on your own is very time consuming. Um, and the Patreon is, is just for folks who genuinely want to contribute to what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. I'm still going to do my Instagram as if I never stopped, but I would, the censorship has affected my personal life greatly because uh, I made, that's how I sell my paintings Yeah, <laughs> is on social media. That's it. I don't belong to a gallery anymore. Um, galleries take a 50% commission. So the the way I make a living is by selling artwork on social media. And because of what I talk about, my social media has either been censored or deactivated. So it's a challenge. It is a great challenge to get the information out that I feel like people need to see. Yeah, I, I don't feel bad about creating the Patreon. I Whenever I shared about that, I did have some comments of people disagreeing with that. But like I say, it's only for people who who want to support me in that way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's like the co the the uh, a, a cup of coffee <laughs> a month. So it's not like, yeah, you know, not like it's a great expense. It's a, it'll be a few bucks type of thing. 
Totally. Um, yeah. But thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. And when you get that set up, you can uh, let me know the link and I can connect it to all these podcasts. I will shout you out everything. Thank you. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs> yeah. So her, her social media, her website, upcoming Patreon, all of that info you'll be able to find in the podcast show notes. So definitely feel free to follow her, connect with her, purchase one of her paintings, couple of her paintings, whatever you feel <laughs> called to do. Yeah, she's a great, a great warrior in this fight. So yeah, thank, thank you. you so much for coming on. I'm excited to talk again. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Of course, we will see you soon. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of The Final Wake Up. I hope this episode Thank you so a much for listening to, to this episode of The Final Wake Up. I hope this episode sparked a flame in you to march if you forward in your deeper down for truth, go to my Instagram happiness and Madison. If you want to dive even there, deeper down the rabbit so hole, many go to my Instagram at madison.polika. There I have so many highlights dedicated to spreading even more information and value. You can also join the club with my email list linked in my bio to stay up to date on all the latest news, sales, and new offerings. Or if if you want to talk to me personally, please send me a DM. I would love to hear from you. If you love this episode, please subscribe and rate and leave an amazing review. Bonus points if you share this to your story and write what you learned. Tag me in it so that I can connect and see how this is actually helping you. If you know somebody who would really appreciate this or somebody who desperately needs to hear what I talked about in this episode, please send this to them. Together, we can bring light to this world full of confusion and help people thrive. Thank you and see you next time.